Hello, my name's Anne-Marie, right around the Murray Festival Director, and we are live streaming to you from here in the Aubrey Library Museum, in our beautiful museum space, here on Wiradjuri country, where we pay respect to Wiradjuri elders past, present and emerging. So it turns out it's quite a novelty this year to have all of our presenters in the same city and in the same room having an in real life conversation, uh, not mediated by the screen. Now, while we're missing you, our live audience, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of you tuning in who wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we first had this, the idea for this conversation uh, late last year. Um, Carla, artistic director at Hot House, and I. And like so many things this year, it, the idea has radically altered. Um, so I'm, I'm just so proud to have really talented local storytellers on the festival program this year. I think now more than ever, it's, it's really important to be talking about local stories, homegrown stories. Um, so I'm just getting way too nervous in front of the camera, so I'm gonna hand over to Carla um, to introduce our panelists, um, who I've watched you know, alter their practice radically in the face of COVID. I have so much admiration for you. Carla, Helen, Alison and Amy, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, so over to you, Carla. Thanks, Ray. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet today, the Wiradjuri people, and pay my respects to their elders and storytellers of the Wiradjuri nation, both past, present and emerging. Uh, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who are tuning in with us today. Diawit, Agus Kade Milafocha, hello and welcome here to the Albury Library Museum um, and to you online tuning in for this year's Ride Around the Murray Festival. My name is Carla Conway and I'm the Artistic Director of Hot House Theatre. Before we begin, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you are uh, watching us online and like to ask some questions throughout our conversation today, you can post those questions into the chat function and um, I will throw them over to the uh, artists as we talk today. It is my absolute pleasure to be talking about this panel's topic, Somebody's Story, with three incredible local artists and powerful women in their own right who have chosen to create their careers based on the telling of other people's stories. So uh, let me introduce writer, magazine editor, children's author, podcast and content creator, Amy Chan. Thanks, Carla. A uh, performer, theatre maker, and one of Australia's leading community artists working in cultural development for social change, Alison Evans. Thanks, Carla. Great to be here. And award-winning filmmaker, video artist, and visual storyteller, Helen Newman. Hi. Thanks, Carla. It's absolutely thrilling to be with the three of you today in Albury, Wodonga, and uh, I thought we'd just dive in before we talk about other people's stories, into your stories a little bit. Um, Helen, you've had an interesting journey into filmmaking, starting as a classical pianist. How did you get into filmmaking? So, yeah, I was um, a classical pianist, and then um, I was involved in um, advocating for the rights of some refugees, and at that stage, a documentary filmmaker came up to Aubrey to document the story, the backstory of what was happening here. And I had become a character in that documentary as it slowly emerged and evolved. And at some point, I don't know when, I picked the camera up and I just went, oh my God, this is just the most incredible tool to give voice to people who can't be heard. So yeah, from there I was just addicted and that's how it happened. <laughs> um, Amy, you work in a lot of different mediums. Um, tell us, how did you get into a space where you preference the telling of other people's stories? Um, yeah, it's a strange thing. It's sort of evolved over time. I've always loved writing, even as a young child. That's what I wanted to be, was a writer. Um, went off, did law school, and came out and was a lawyer for a few years, and found that even that, the process of that was about <coughs> telling other people's stories. You're trying to capture people's voice and then advocate for them in a legal space. And so 
that's sort of where I've always gravitated towards. Um, I did several years in magazines, and again, my favourite part of that job was always the interviews. The writing, the fashion stories and the beauty stories never really interested me. It was sitting down and speaking to other people and capturing their stories. So I'm very interested in that process of giving voice, as Helen said, to people who can't necessarily express themselves or don't have a public platform with which to do it, um, and finding that right medium to really represent the other person's story. Hmm. Alison, um, as a performer and a theatre maker, um, you've taken a long journey from Wales to Darwin to Albury, Wodonga. Tell us how that journey came about and what led you specifically into community arts? Well, coming, I think growing up in the Welsh Valleys like I did, I definitely came from a story telling family, particularly with my father and my grandmother, and also the location um, really was beneficial for your imaginations because it was an old coal mining valley. And so I would spend my Sundays up the mountains with my grandmother, making up sto stories in the old quarries and ghost stories from the old shafts <laughs> and things like that. Um, and then I became really interested in the world and what was out there because we were quite in a small bubble, really. And so did a bit of travel and became really interested in people's stories. And I think then as an adult, realising that I was kind of going in towards community arts uh, practice, that as a child growing up in those valleys, I really benefited from community arts, even though I didn't realise that was what I was participating in, mm. and how much that had such a great benefit on my life, um, because it gave me a platform to share my own story. So I wanted to do that for others, and was really interested in different stories, um, and so came to Darwin to work um, up there, and worked a lot in remote indigenous communities, Thought I was coming for one year, and 10 years later, still here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to throw it open to the three of you. What brings you to a story? What, what, what makes something trigger in your own mind that says, ah, I, here's a space that I think I need to enter? For me, I think it's just having conversations with people and maybe different kind of um, service providers or organisations as well. I really enjoy um, helping people realise that they actually, they have a story, no matter who you are, where you're from, what your background is, there's always something really interesting and just through simple conversation going, oh, that sounds good, let's go down that route, let's find out more. Um, Helen, you know, in a documentary filmmaking sense, what makes a great subject? What, what makes a, a, you go, where you say, here's a person whose story I feel like I really need to take carriage of? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. And it's the, the micro of that, that individual and the story that they have to tell, but where that is set in, in a universal way that will resonate with an audience. Mm. So, um, yeah, meeting someone who can tell their story, who has a very layered, rich story to tell, but um, there will be elements in that story that I'll see will resonate with many other people. So it becomes their story that connects to many other people's stories. I, I guess that's often my interest when, mm. I'm, when I'm looking at doing a documentary. Yeah. Amy, it, it, somewhat similar um, for you, y you work often with um, either subjects or, you know, in some of your non-fiction working clients who um, come to you with a story. Um, and, and you were sharing with me earlier that sometimes that's not the story. <laughs> yeah, that's how, it. How do, you, how do you undertake that process uh, with a subject or with a client to determine what the story is that you think needs to be told? I think a lot of it for me is about time. So you need to build rapport with the subject, you need to spend time with them, get to know them, find out who they are, and then that's where you find the story. So for me, the story is often in the unexpected. So as an example, Helen and I have worked together for several years. I had no idea she was a classical pianist. So <laughs> that's something that's really interesting to me. So um, I guess the story that I told you about was when I was doing some client work, they wanted me to write a story about promoting a new playground that had been architecturally designed. It was all cutting edge, lots of sensory elements. And as I was writing this story, I kept thinking, this is not an interesting story. Nobody cares about the playground, who the architect is. This is not interesting. <laughs> And right at the end, after we'd published it, the um, architecture firm and the PR firm who had designed this very, very expensive playground just said off the cuff to me, oh, and it glows in the dark. And I was like, well, that was the story. 
story. <laughs> that was the story, but it was too late. So it is a lot about time for me, having that time and investment and really spending time to get to know who it is you're writing the story about to find the story. Alison, when you come into a, a, a new community or a, a cultural group or, you know, with some of your work up in, in Northern Territory, uh, what do you think needs to be in place to enable the people within that community to open up to you, um, particularly when you are new into that, into that community? Uh, how, how, what are the conditions that need to be created to enable them to actually open up to you and... and entrust you with their story? Yeah, I think kind of like what Amy said, it's time, so not expecting to go in and within a few days or a few weeks for people to build that trust. So really de uh, designating a lot of time. So particularly when I've worked um, with remote Indigenous communities, gosh, I might go in and speak go in weekly and for months just sit there with everyone and drink tea or make tea, you know, and just really build trust that way. Mm. I think also be, being really open and sharing about myself too. It's not about, it's all about you. I want to take your stories. Um, definitely in Australia, I've found that being Welsh can be really beneficial <laughs> because I feel like it gives me um, the opportunity to openly say, actually, I'm new here and I don't know, this is what it's like in my culture or in my language, what's it like for you? Mm. So that cultural sharing um, is always there from the beginning as well, which is what I think helps encourage people open up because there's a lot of similarities as well. Helen, when you do uh, documentaries that are historical, so, you know, you did recently a beautiful piece now and then for Flying Fruit Fly yeah. Circus. Um, how do you look back over 40 years of an organisation and figure out how to tell its story? That's such a yeah. huge... Yeah. Story. How do you how do you how do you go from forty years to fifteen minutes or a thirty minute story? Yeah, it was huge. And I, I don't always want to do linear storytelling, but for that, it definitely was moving through the forty years. So, getting the voices of the people that were there right at the beginning and had those memories, and then just yeah, just working my way through that. And I guess with documentary filmmaking, and particularly in this digital age, you can film so much content. And then it's about, I often say it's like killing your babies. You have to get rid of some of those stories and distill it down to the core messages that you're trying to tell and mm. then balance that as well with giving everyone enough of their own voice so that they're represented. So, yeah, it's an interesting... For me, the storytelling that I do is like weaving a, a, a rug. I just have these threads that I work through and sometimes they pop up and they disappear and a new thread comes in and it just is a, is a fine weave. Um, when you, oh, this is really for all three of you because I think it's, it's sort of applicable across your practice and it doesn't really matter what the medium is, but when you, um, when you enter that relationship with, um, with a person whose story or a, or a group or a community, what are the inherent promises that you're making to them um, from the outset that um, enables them to trust you with the, some of those decisions, um, and you know, to take uh, what does that responsibility feel like when you engage in that relationship? Amy, do you want to? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, for me. It's a lot about respecting the other person's story and the way they would want it to be represented. So maybe the person might have told you the story as an example in a linear fashion, but you think that it would be told better, sort of jumping backwards and forwards and all over the place but the essence of the story is still the way that they would want it to be represented. So I think a lot of that trust building at that stage when you are encouraging them to open up, and Alison's quite right, sharing stories about yourself with them and how, you know, I'm nervous about this too, I'm nervous about this process, <laughs> I want to make sure that I protect the integrity of your story, that sort of thing to me is really, really important. So an example of that would be we did a podcast series about 18 months ago for Murray Arts called Beyond YOLO, and the very first episode I recorded was with an 18-year-old local Wodonga girl who had been through a really traumatic time. Um, parents were drug users, there was prostitution, there was abuse, there was a whole lot of really terrible things that had happened to this girl. And I really felt an immense sense of responsibility to protect her story, and I just made sure that every time I was with her, we always had an adult in the room with us, so it was never her and I and her feeling vulnerable. She always had a support person with her, 
but I always said at the start of every session, I want you to tell me if we go too far, if we talk about things you're uncomfortable with, if you tell me something and you change your mind and you don't want that to be on the record, just call me and just constantly reassuring her that the integrity of her story and her voice would be protected so that she would feel that the end product was something that really represented her and her true experience. Yeah. Mm. Um, Helen, you've done um, some really uh, difficult stories. Uh, Cambodia's Daughters mm. um, was quite a powerful one, just kind of lifting up f from, from what Amy was saying. What brought you to, um, to that story? Cambodia's Daughters is about the sex trafficking trade of young girls in Cambodia. Yeah. How, did you, how did you connect in with that story and how did you go about um, protecting the integrity and the authenticity of that experience in the storytelling? Yeah, and the extra layer being, of course, that it was in Khmer, so it wasn't in English, so I had to go through an interpreter to tell the story as well. Yeah. Um, so I connected with the, an organisation that worked with young girls that um, had been trafficked for sex in Cambodia, and my brief was to do a short film about their stories, and I think I was very much in that sense led by the main woman that had been almost like their mother, I think. She, she was their main support once they'd left the, the trafficking. So in that, in that instance, she led me about how much could be shared, what questions could be asked. So it was quite different to, say, um, other documentaries and even the documentary I'm working on now about survivors of suicide where I'm making the same decisions about... I'm going to honour your story. Um, I'm going to make sure that along the way we check in. If it's not OK, I don't want to go too far. It, it needs to be something that when that person sees it at the end of it, they go, yes, that's me. I recognise myself there. That's, mm. that's honest and true. So, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a movement. And along the way also, you know, if I create something and it doesn't feel right, I always show it to my my characters, I call them. I don't really know what to call them. They're people. <laughs> um, and check that they're OK before it goes out to the rest of the world. So well. there's a fair bit of back and forth. Absolutely. Is, yeah, yeah. 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 Alison, um, has there ever been a time where uh, you've gone through this process and it's just really derailed or gone wrong? For you? Um, I think not so much gone really wrong in terms of like what Helena and Amy saying around that collaboration and that's the way I definitely try and approach it and because what I'm doing with these stories is making theatre um, it's very much a large involvement in that the performers are often the people whose stories it is mm. um, so it hasn't gone horribly wrong I think the most difficult times has been when say a service provider or someone an organization has brought me in to work with a specific community but they have ideas as to what they want the content to be versus what the community want it to be and something I try and make really clear if I'm ever working with an organization that it's the community members who come first um, and I will never push an agenda on them mm. and so sometimes those relationships can be a bit difficult between myself and the service providers in um, yeah coming about that understanding of um, I suppose I'm working with real people's stories and I'm going to honour that. Do you find that with the service providers in opening that dialogue when the agenda that they had is not actually materialising in the way that they anticipated um, that they do recognise that maybe their perspective is not right, is not um, yeah, accurate it can do. to what, what's really at play. Yeah, and I suppose often with larger organisations like health um, organisations and, you know, things like that, um, kind of the level who I'm working with recognise it, but when you go up, 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 to who, I don't know, are funding it and things, they have a much more structured way of working. So for Obviously, they're trying to tick boxes. Trying to they? tick boxes. and um, So for me, it's about trying to bring the organisation into the work, into the workshops, to actually be really connecting with the community mm. to see this is what the community needs. In a way, as an artist, you do have a, a really rich opportunity while you're telling that story and that's a process that you're undertaking with your subject or with your community or the group, that there, there is also this bridging role that, that is occurring between, um, between that community and an audience 
or an organisation or government or council. Do you know what I mean? So how, do, how have you found, um, Amy, uh, becoming the bridge? You know, how, how have you found that's manifested in your work? Yeah, that's a really... Alison has really hit the nail on the head with that. It's a very complex um, relationship. And I would imagine Helen would be quite in a similar boat to me in that mm. storytelling is all very good and well, but you have to get paid. So there is always a third party who is involved in the process because they're either funding your project or they're the publisher of the magazine or they have somehow given you a grant for which you are doing this project. And so it, trying to balance those interests can be really difficult. And I find that that's where, when you make those promises to your interview subjects about that I'm going to protect your story, I'm going to protect the things that we have agreed between us will or will not be put out into the public space, you really have to be prepared to go in and sometimes there is a bit of conflict to battle for those sorts of things. So for me, I'm the same as Helen in that I will always show my subjects what is about to go out in the public space, particularly if it's very sensitive ahead of time. But then I really try to make sure that I have really tight control over everything so that every step of the way... So an example would be when I was in magazines, I interviewed a filmmaker who was very famous in Singapore where I was living at that time. He'd had a very serious accident, become a quadriplegic and become a recluse. And so he had agreed to share his story with me, but I was very aware it was the first time it was going into the public space. He was a public figure and he was very, very sensitive about it. So the magazine that I was working for at the time wanted to put on the front cover a picture of a truck to indicate that he'd been hit by a truck and made a quadriplegic. Wow. And we had to have quite a <laughs> lengthy conversation <laughs> about why this was not an appropriate way to represent that story. Mm. So I do think you have to have um, a bit of a thick skin and develop a bit of an armour to really go in and battle for your subject to make sure that the integrity of the story is protected but that you can still balance those commercial interests. So at the end of the day, if the people who are funding you don't want to publish it, there's no work. Yeah. Mm. And I think my biggest learning is over the years of being now, and particularly as an independent artist um, like yourselves, now it's about, I'm very clear from the beginning, if, if an external provider is asking me to go into work with a community of asking the questions of, how long have you worked in this community? Have the community specifically asked for this? You know, just to mm. make sure and now saying no. Because um, I don't want to be in those situations and put community members in that situation where, yeah, they haven't asked for this and something's trying to be forced on them. Mm. So being very clear what projects I accept now. I think it's a, it's a genuine evolution of this into process and, and starting to talk about the the, the different processes that you have, um, primarily working in screen, primarily working in theatre, but um, for you, Amy, working really across a whole different range of mediums. How, um, Helen, I might start with you. Um, talk to me a little bit about your process from when you've been, um, been asked to create either commissioned to make a work or something that you're initiating yourself. What are, what are the processes that you go through? Um, so once, once I've decided that I think that I would like to be part of that project, um, I would then research, 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 research the story behind it, everything that I can find out about it to see if it's still a good fit with, um, with what I think it's going to be, if it's still what I think it is. That, um, and then, yeah, it's just communication then. And definitely communicating the whole way along. If I'm commissioned to do something, I'm just, like, emailing, CCing all the time, letting them have attending meetings, making sure that there's a really good open communication. And same with the characters or the people that I'm working with as mm -hmm. well. So I think it's about, it's about communication and also, yeah, and time as well, giving it time. And how do you go about um, starting to collect the film footage. A lot of your work has not just been in Australia, but is, has been internationally too. Yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, your journey to Afghanistan and um, how you went about navigating the, 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 or the cultural challenges of gathering video material in another country? Yeah, so um, a few of the overseas shoots, I would, I would have a family or individuals that are there, that are connected, particularly going into dangerous situations like that. Um, I always had a connection on the ground mm -hmm. so that, I mean, it's, it's so often the characters or people who are connected to the communities, that, that would be my way in. Um, and 
then I've actually forgotten the question. Well, just asking, <laughs> you know, what is the process that you go through in order to kind of gather the footage and the interviews and the materials that you need, particularly when there's those cultural cultural differences or challenges internationally? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it is that, it's that personal connection that I already have. So an example is that... Um, I'd been filming a story of a family that had been in detention here in Australia for four and a half years, and I'd visited them probably once, a, once every month during that time, seen their children grow up. And when um, the US um, invaded Iraq, soon after that, they were forcibly returned back to Iraq because it was meant to be a safe country. So this relationship and story that I was telling about this family in detention in Australia suddenly was in Iraq. And, but, but they were my connection. So, you know, when I got to Iraq, it was their son that met us on the border and he, he drove us into their family home. So it, it very much for me, it is the story. I'm just following the lead. Like, I actually never meant to go to Iraq. I wasn't, didn't want to go to Iraq. But <laughs> <laughs> that's where the story went. And I think same with Afghanistan. I didn't plan to go there, but I was telling people stories and that was where the story ended up. So that yep. was where I went. Yeah, Alison, how how do you um, how do you do a similar thing? How do you engage in in, in the process of gathering the materials um, that are required to piece together a work that you want to present for oh, a public showing? Very much through uh, workshopping and just down to kind of core drama workshops. Really, um, I particularly work with a methodology titled. It's got a very ominous name of Theatre of the Oppressed, <laughs> which people are often quite scared of, um, by Augusta Boal. But it's very much about working with community members who are non-actors and how to engage them. And it is not about um, training to be a performer or on TV or anything, but it's how to use creative um, methodologies to help share stories. So, for example, a lot of the work that I do um, are with culturally and linguistically diverse communities. So things like image theatre, which is instead, instead of telling me about your life growing up, can you use your body to create some still images, create a picture with our bodies of what dinner time looked like as a child, and I'll be your mother, and these can be your siblings, is a much easier way to communicate rather than having to communicate through English or with a translator. So using those basic drama methods just really start eking out different types of stories. And you were telling me about um, uh, an international residency that you took up in Cambodia uh, where you were using forum theatre. So forum theatre is um, another uh, methodology of Augusto Boal's and a way of... Um, for communities to face an oppressive situation or a conflict that they're experiencing within their communities. Talk to me about how your plans um, using this forum theatre were derailed. Yes, so I was working with a group of art therapists and an awareness theatre troupe um, in Battambang in Cambodia, and we were creating some forum theatre plays, some small performances that reflected the experiences of the community members they were working with. Um, it was all done through a translator, Helen, so as you know how difficult that could be. Um, and one of the performances that they created, which they said they often face, was with um, a woman with a small child and her husband was having an affair and spending all the money on this other woman and assaulting his wife. Um, so they, with Forum Theatre, you present the problem. You don't solve it like traditional storytelling because you offer that out to the community to work on um, who are the audience members. Um, and during this training process, their final scene was that they, the husband divorced the wife. And so the tran through the translator, I was trying to say, we need to cut that scene because that kind of solves, you know, it kind of solves something because it separates them. They didn't want to. I was thinking, gosh, the trans am I not translate? How am I communicating this? Mm -hmm. And then when it came to performing it to the community where there was a few hundred people there, I was facilitating the discussion through a translator and that's when I realised the problem was actually the fact that the husband was wanting to um, divorce the wife because that had much more severe consequences in Cambodia to be a single woman with a child. And so the 
kind of on stage in front of a community, I had this big realization of, of course, it's a massive cultural difference. And it was my first experience facilitating a discussion to try and solve a problem at a point of which, in my very privileged upbringing, I completely disagreed with. But it's not my culture, it's not my community. And I could only do as I could as a facilitator to try and help the situation as an external person. Um, it's a really good segue to a question that we've got from our viewer. So hello, Nat Ord, lovely to see you. <laughs> um, uh, Nat asks, empathy is obviously a key trait needed for strong storytelling. Uh, for telling stories with trauma, how do you remain empathetic without taking on that emotional trauma? And how do you look after your own mental health? Mm. Ha maybe? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. The great thing in, again, Augusta Bowell's work, of which I work with a lot, it's very much the role's called a joker because it's about being a neutral card. So um, absolutely, I empathise um, so much with the communities that I work with and whew, can really feel that, but also really remember that I'm a neutral card that as a facilitator to bring my skill as a theatre maker to help put their stories out into the world so that them stories are shared. Mm. Um, definitely it can be really difficult as we would all be away working from in prisons and people from refugee backgrounds. Um, for me, seeing a psychologist is really important and one that has experience in the arts in, in those type of um, settings, just to be able to offload and look at how do I safeguard myself. Mm. And uh, I would add to that too around the supports is also friends who yes. get it, mm -hmm. people who understand that you can also, you don't have to unpackage what, what it is, you can share with them. So another good support mechanism yes. is that. But it's, I think for me, like certainly I, I film a lot of trauma, but there's such a sense of honour in people sharing and trusting me that in some ways that mitigates the trauma that I could take on. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Amy, talk to me about our first responders. This is a project, um, sort of a multidisciplinary project that you've been create, uh, curating. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about our first responders and um, how you decided what mediums to tell that story in? And we'll talk a little bit about wellbeing in there too. Sure. So I wanted to do something around the bushfire crisis from this year and at the end of last year. Um, and I just felt so helpless because I was watching people who were cooking meals and, um, you know, sewing masks and building buildings. And I, as a creative, was like, well, what can I do? What can I do to show, other than giving money, show that, you know, that this experience has impacted my community and that we want to recognise what has happened? So I thought that a storytelling project might be a way to do this. And I wanted something that would really integrate the community and give voice to the first responders who I think we really rely on in those times of crisis and then are sort of forgotten. And especially this year with the COVID coming right on the back of the bushfires. So I had a long think about it um, and I approached the Border Mail and the Border Mail agreed to let us use some of their images from the bushfires. And then I approached several firefighters and we decided to record their stories as podcasts. And so the idea was the exhibition was to go up in the main street of Wodonga, outside that man's building, which is where the Coles is, as these great big um, sort of four by three metre paste up, temporary paste ups, that you could walk past and stand in front of and look at and absorb these images from the bushfires, but also at the same time, each image would come with a podcast story of a first person narrative of a first responder talking about what had happened to them. So with all these lofty ideas, I thought this is great. I don't know how I'm gonna fund this several thousand dollar project. And it turned out that I was able to get all the funding through community. So it was all small businesses who donated money to support the project. Um, and it was supposed to go up this year, but it didn't because of social distancing. So it now lives online as on the website called ourfirstresponders.com.au and at some point when the restrictions lift in Victoria, we will install it. And the whole idea of it was for it to act as a bit of not only voice for the first responders, but also a space where the community could come and stand and reflect and acknowledge and also somehow kind of process their own trauma in a public space where it's shared, but it's not so intimate that people feel 
scared or um, vulnerable about sort of being exposed and going through the emotions of that. Mm. And I think for everyone involved, from the people who donated through to the first responders, through to the creatives who all donated their time, I think for all of us, it was a bit of a way for us to also process some of the grief and trauma and to feel like we were mobilising to show support for these people who had risked their lives and some lost their lives mm. trying to protect us. It is a, it is a powerful thing when you, when you actually think about the impact of sharing stories and, and what that impact has on the community, on, on, on people who are able to take them in. And I know... Um, you know, we, we were absolutely impacted here on the border uh, uh, around the bushfire season and thankfully not to the extent that other towns were. But there is still a shared collective grief and a shared collective trauma that's existed through that process. And um, I think what's so, what's so extraordinary about telling other people's stories is even though it, it might not necessarily be our specific story, uh, it enables us a, a way of processing and, um, and being able to come to a realisation about what that experience is that we have collectively gone through. And some of the, um, you know, another, I think, great example, and I think moving from exactly what you were saying about people being able to um, stand in a shared space and take something on without it being a vulnerable space um, kind of leads me to the other end, which is about people standing together totally in a vulnerable space in Solstice. Um, Helen, talk to me a little bit about your journey with Solstice um, with Annette and Stuart Baker from the live to what became the COVID version of Sol Solstice Online this year. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that? About the evolution of yeah. the story? Yeah. yeah. So I... Um I began this documentary called Solstice um, early on when I, I met with Annette and Stuart and they asked me to film the live event they hold each year here called the Winter Solstice and it's held on the 21st of June and um, what they've created is a, a, a fairly sacred space in QE2 Square where people are exactly that. It's, it's a, 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 a space where hundreds of people come who are openly vulnerable um, and I think there's a huge symbolism in that, in terms of that public event runs parallel to the vulnerability that Annette and Stuart and the story that I'm telling um, of everyone that has put their voice into this story about survivors of suicide. So it's been a journey. There's, there's, there's the thread of Annette and Stuart and other voices of survivors of suicide through it. And the other thread has been the winter solstice, which is such a powerful symbol. That event is such a powerful symbol for how people do connect um, through pain and loss, but through the warmth that comes with that share, that sharing of pain and loss as well. And so I thought I was telling a story and I thought that I was nearly finished. And then, then the fires happened and that resonated, I think, through the psyche of our nation. And I'm like, well, I can't, I can't not acknowledge that in this film about loss and trauma. People were taking, have taken their lives post fires. And I think the trauma of the fires has added to the mental health damage that's happened in a lot of communities. So I'm like, I can't leave that. And then COVID happened. And so it's been this amorphous story that just keeps changing shape. But I, as I was saying to you earlier, I kind of like the layering of that. Sure, I didn't plan to be working for so long on this story, but I like the layering of what it's done. It feels more... It feels more truthful in a way, not mm. that it wasn't before, but more truthful at more layers or more representative. Yeah. yeah, so it's now become a global story. Amazing. I've got a question uh, from our viewers, uh, Dottie Simmons. Thanks, Dottie. Um, can you give an example um, of a particularly, and you don't need to include names, but of a particularly unforgettable story which you're particularly proud of having told? Um, one that is a group one for me, and this is when I first um, came to the Northern Territory from Wales, which, as you can imagine, was a huge shock to the system, being in the tropics. Um, and that first year, I would spend every week flying out to the Tiwi Islands um, and working with a group of young people out there, young women. And what happened was, over two years, we ended up creating a performance together, looking at... Um, young women's lives on the Tiwi Islands now and across um, all different times in history. Um, and this year-long, well, two-year-long process 
was really big and what it meant was the young women went and met with um, elders and found out new information and new songs and dances that they didn't know before and we put all that into a performance that they then performed and it was a really fantastic thing just to see these young women get really inspired about sharing their culture and their story to younger um, to younger children and to me that really stands out um, because it was my first time coming from Wales where I was in a whole new culture and space <laughs> that I had no idea about um, but yeah could share and use my skills of how to kind of put that together into a performance so it was a real collaboration and a really positive one. And passing on that intergenerational knowledge too I think what a privilege. Mm -hmm. Amy, do you have a, a, a story that for you that's a particularly unforgettable one? Yeah, so I've got a podcast series called Kids Pod, which is primary school kids asking adults the questions they want to know. <laughs> um, and so the whole concept is nothing is too rude to ask. They can ask whatever they want. It's open slather. And so we did an interview with a lady by the name of Stacey Title, who has been affected by ALS. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows very much about that, but that has really robbed her of her life. It has taken mm. all her movements, um, all her speech. The only movement she can do is sometimes she can move one of her eyes and that's it. So she has to be fed, she has to be cleaned. This fully grown independent woman with grown children has lost everything. So we did a podcast episode with her and her husband. So as you can imagine, she can't speak. So the bulk of the questions were answered by her husband. But there was one point in the podcast where one of the kids asked a very specific question of Stacey specifically. And the husband said to me, what do you want to do? We can just turn off the recording. I can get the answer for you, and then we can turn on the recording. And I said, let's just leave it and see what happens. So we recorded it in real time of him saying, going through every letter of the alphabet, trying to decipher which letter of the alphabet for each you know, part of the word that she was trying to say. He wasn't sure, then he was sure, then the adult son came in. And he goes on for about, I think it's about two minutes of this backwards and forwards, and I published the episode like that, as is, and I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud that she, in that kind of a state, was still able to have some sort of a voice on an audio platform, so it's not even visual. The kids can't even see her. They're just listening to this process of this woman who has no voice finding her voice again, and that's Amazing. something that will stay with me for a very long time. Yeah. Amazing. Helen, have you got, have you got something in particular that, um, that is just see it in your I've got, in your yeah, I've got a few. I was just like madly thinking, oh, which one? Um, I, I think there's a, there's a story that I told in um, a feature doc I was working on called Anthem, and it was a, score, a story that terrified me. I didn't want to do it. It was a story of a family that had come to Australia by boat, and their boat had, got, had, had sunk, and they'd lost three of their children. And I was really scared to meet the mother and tell her story, but... We did, so we met with the mother and the father um, and their newborn baby, and I think why I'm proud of it is because they, got, they finally got to Australia and they were settled here, which is, is fantastic, but they'd never been able to have their grief acknowledged in any way. They had no grave for their children. Of course, because of our policy around refugees, there was, there was no um, public acknowledgement of what had gone on. Um, what I was really proud of was at the end of it, when the film was done, was Sondos came to us and said, thank you, thank you for telling that story. And I think it, it honoured her children. Mm. And so, yeah, for me, that was like, yes, this is why I do it. It's to, to give voice and to honour someone. So, yeah, that was one that mattered a lot. Talking of honouring someone, Amy, you recently had published your first picture book, your children's picture book, uh, My Grandma is 100. Um, talk to me a little bit about the process of interviewing Grandma Edna and, um, and that straight documentation of history. There's, there's a bit of a story to uh, the process of <laughs> arriving at this children's book. Tell us a little bit about Grandma Edna. Sure. So Grandma Edna is actually my husband, well, was my husband's grandmother. So I've known her for a very long time, 25 years or something. And all this time I'd known that I wanted to try and capture a bit of her story, a bit of her voice. But as a writer, the thought of sitting there and typing out what she was saying didn't seem right, didn't really fit well with me. And so I couldn't quite figure out how this was going to happen. Um, and as I started, as my career went on and I started doing some podcasting, I thought maybe the podcast is the way to go, to capture her audio voice. So 
trying to schedule. She was in Melbourne. I was in Albury. I've got two young kids. She doesn't like to be visited between certain hours of the day. So trying to find a time <laughs> when this 100-year-old woman and myself could actually sit down and have some time took quite a long time. But we did it, and we sat down, and she had obviously been thinking about the things she was going to tell me, and she really opened up. It was this beautiful few hours where we sat and we just talked and talked, and I had the video camera running, and the, uh, no, it wasn't a video camera, sorry, it was my phone running, trying to capture the audio. And at the end of it, it was finished, I went to check the file, and the file had gone. The whole thing vanished. And to this day, <laughs> I don't know where it went. It's disappeared into the ether. So as you can imagine, I was devastated. Um, and, you know, just really traumatised. How am I ever going to get this kind of content again? What would the kids have thought? And I started to think about how they would have reacted if they could have heard some of her stories. And then that's when the idea for the children's book came about. <laughs> so, in a way, it was very serendipitous because um, I think the process of creating the children's book was actually much more joyous than it would have been to sit and try and sort of documentary style capture what she had to say. Um, and she has, uh, that has actually gone on to reach a much wider audience than what it would have had it just been me transcribing her audio because it would have only gone to the immediate family. But now there are children all over Australia and indeed the world who know who Grandma Edna is now. So that's, that's cool. been really lovely. Um, talk to me a little bit about the process of um, capturing the essence of Grandma Edna with an illustrator, and an illustrator who's on the other side of the world. Yeah, so my <laughs> illustrator is Angela Perini. She lives in Italy. We've never met. So <laughs> it was all done by email correspondence online. Um, and essentially, I deliberately did not send her any images of Edna in the beginning. I just said to her, I want you to send me some character illustrations and let's see how we go. And I think she really captured the essence of who Edna was. Um, you know, which is always very cheerful, always very upbeat that kind of generation, they never talked about this was the highlight of my life, this was the low light of my life. They didn't see life that way. Life was just life. And, you know, you're born, you go to school, you get married, you have your own children, and that's how it was. And so I felt that she really captured that sense of that generation and the positivity and the we just take every day at a time and we don't look at things in that kind of dramatic way that I suppose we do now of positives and negatives. Life is just as it is. And I think I was really lucky to stumble on into an illustrator who was able to capture her so beautifully, having never met me, never met Edna, <laughs> never seen any images of Edna, and she still, <laughs> I think, really captured her brilliantly. Um, we have a question from 10-year-old Cecilia Burke, say, who, who asks, where do you get story ideas from? So you've got all this, all, all this interview material, um, but where did you get the idea of the birthday party, for example? Um, I guess because when I decided that I wanted to, when I was sort of thinking about how the kids would have reacted, could they have heard Edna's story, I started to hear a child's voice. So then I just tried to sort of write down what, from a child's perspective, is interesting about turning 100 years old. So obviously, birthday parties are a huge milestone for children in that age group who <laughs> read picture books. Birthday parties, the cake, the presents, the candles. And so that then just naturally became a story about the birthday party because that number 100 is just so massive when you're four, five, six, seven years old. <laughs> and then to think about, would you have 100 people? Would you have 100 candles? Um, kind of just very nicely encapsulated that idea. Um, Alison, talk to us a little bit about um, uh, the social impact of your process. Uh, there was a beautiful project you did in, in Roselle in Sydney called Connect with Red Door Arts. Talk to us a little bit about Connect and the impact that that process had on the community that it, that it, it was made for. Yeah, that was a project that started out um, small and then just developed into this huge thing. Um, so whilst I was Arts Access and Development Manager at Red Door Arts, um, we had um, a service provider again come to us to say, can you make some educational films about access and the issues of access within the communities for people with disabilities? I was like, oh gosh, there's so many of these <laughs> films out there that's not very interesting. Who even watches them? What can we do? Um, and so what we did is um, myself and um, artist Emily Dash is we then said, right, come on, let's make a theatre show. 
If they want us to think about access in the community, then let's do it out in the community. And so the result was an immersive theatre performance where the audience members were led around Griselle um, by writer and performer Emily Dash, who's also in a wheelchair. So they got to experience firsthand the difficulty that Emily faces day to day. We also included all of the participants who attend Red, Red Door Arts programs, from a senior um, people, community members with intellectual disability, to young performers, to a special education school unit. Um, and this performance took place all around Roselle, and we went and spoke to local businesses as well. And we found out stories such as, um, one of our ensemble members, she always goes to the fruit shop and always gets given some free juice. Um, and I said, oh, can you take me and um, introduce them? And so this ensemble member with um, Down syndrome took me to the shop. She was so comfortable in there. They loved her. There was this great <laughs> friendship. And from speaking to them, I found out that actually um, it was a family-run business and their eldest son, who's now an adult, um, has severe autism and lives in a care home for that. Um, and so we ended up interviewing this family and our audiences got taken to the shop, got given free juice, <laughs> whilst listening to this um, story. Um, and in it, one of the family members said, for us, we just really hope that um, my brother, when he's in the community, that he's treated the way that we, we do the same. Mm. And I just remember a moment where um, we were in there with all these community members, all dr audience, drinking their juice. And <laughs> the mum was there from the shop. And the son who spoke gave her the headset and her just crying into his arms as she listened to this story. So it had a huge impact on the whole community mm. who came on board and got to experience it. Um, the Solstice Project is, is obviously, um, it is multi-layered. It is a big community event here in Albury, Wodonga. The, the impact of, uh, of the winter solstice organisation and event is starting to really grow internationally and then the documentary is giving it another layer and another voice again. What are the impacts that you've observed over your time with Solstice um, that, are, that are positive? Oh yeah, I'm giving voice, absolutely. Mm. Giving, um, like I just described before, that safe space in QE2 Square for our local community and people who travel to it. Like, People travel from Melbourne for the winter solstice. They tra it's so, to, that physical event is so incredibly unique. There's nothing like it mm. anywhere else. Um, and this year, because of COVID, we, um, we actually did a virtual online event. So we were in a studio in Melbourne. We'd pre-recorded a lot of the, um, the content beforehand. And so suddenly that intimate space was in the virtual space and mm. there were people watching from around the world. So I think, and, and again, there was just such, from the comments, I got a sense, such a hunger for connection, mm. for a space where you're understood um, around, you know, that, that really scary S word that people don't like to say. So mm. um, there's, I, I, again, I've forgotten your question. I'm sorry. Well, what, <laughs> what, what, what's the impact that you've observed yeah, so the from impact, it, yeah? yeah, the impact is, it's creating change, it's, and, it's, yeah. and I think it's also saving lives. Um, in, in terms, yeah, in terms of the layers that are happening and the ripple effects that are happening from this, there's conversations being started, there's people bravely stepping out where they wouldn't have done before, mm. there's a change in consciousness as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible what we have. So it's certainly story worthy. Yeah. Yeah. Amy, um, a project of yours that we haven't spoken about or that you were involved in is Women of the River. Um, talk to me about the, the impact that Women of the River has had on the four uh, artists that you worked with. Uh, yeah, I think it's been really an amazing kind of revelation for everyone involved. I think the women that were profiled um, were across the board very surprised, number one, that I would want to profile them. <laughs> like somebody said earlier, everyone thinks they don't have a story and yet they do. So to then see themselves sort of blown up into these sort of three, four metre high images on the sides of public spaces that you can see walking down the street, driving past in your car, with their personal story written about them, I think was 
extremely um, flattering and I think they felt really, not, not honoured, but certainly like somebody acknowledged Same. them and their story and recognised their existence. And I think that sense of acknowledging these women in our society who are often the unsung heroes, who are often the ones in the background doing all the hard work, not necessarily getting the glory and the public mm. exposure. I think that that feeling resonated through everyone who was involved. So the photographers as well, I think, really felt um, that they got to show some of their creativity and show off some of their skills and their abilities by capturing these beautiful, really creative black and white images of these women. So I think across the board, it was very, very um, positively received. And I think people who were initially in just uncomfortable with the idea of themselves being on a public wall ended up actually being very proud that <laughs> mm. they were selected and asked to be part of the project. And what impact do you think your podcast, uh, Beyond YOLO and uh, Kids Pod, have had on the young people that were involved in there? I think a lot in that similar way of the whole process of storytelling is acknowledging somebody's story has worth. Mm. And when you say someone's story has worth, it means that they have worth. Yeah. And so I think even when you publish a podcast or a story in a magazine that nobody else listens to, it's in the public space and that in itself gives validation to the subject. Mm. So I think by, I found particularly with Kids Pod, working with kids who are not being interviewed but who are coming up with the questions, mm. so they kind of form the direction of each episode of the podcast. I think that's really validating for the kids. I've really seen the kids evolve their public speaking, their elocution, their ability to read and write has really excelled and blossomed because they now see themselves as worthy of being interviewers mm. as their questions are important to other people and can make a podcast episode that people can listen to in the US, in Europe, in Asia. And so I think it really is all about that, that idea of if you put people's voice into the public space, people feel like they are recognised, they feel seen and that is really half the battle, particularly in a time when we are all so isolated um, and people are not seeing their loved ones and their friends and family and people are in lockdown. This is a way for people to feel like I'm still heard, I'm still here and people still do care about what I have to say. Yeah. It's a really interesting thing because we seem to place a fair bit of value in other people's stories and we, we're, we, we see the value in their story and we um, see the impact that the sharing of that story can have but often don't see that same value in our own story or recognise that we even have a story that is worthy of being told. How do we get our broader community members to start really unpacking the potential of their own story and seeing the worth and the value that, uh, that their, their individual experiences might have for the community? Alison? Uh, yeah, so one of, um, one of my current projects that I'm working on um, with another local producer and theatre maker, Tani Frudist, is called, originally was called Neighbour, which is a theatre performance set around the dinner table with four different community members from different cultural backgrounds in Aubrey Wodonga, and the audience would come and share dinner amongst this performance. Um, but now that COVID's hit, um, thanks to the wonderful writer on the Murray, uh, we've adapted the program so that it's now online called The Neighbourhood. And part of that is we really want people mm -hmm. to really understand that we want their stories and their stories are so interesting. And so it's an online mapping project where people from our local area can add their stories based on the theme of home and put, connect them to the map. And what's been really fantastic, um, we launched that um, at the start of WAM. Um, and what's been great is people have been able to share their story, but also connect with others through their stories as well. And I think just even having that platform, which is all about community members, you can really see, oh yeah, actually I do have a story like that, I can tell. <laughs> I have a similar experience and it's just short stories. And yeah, I hope really encouraging the community to realize that they have that. We're living through a pretty profound global moment right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. What, in your view, um, is the story or what are the stories that for you individually, and we'll start with you, Helen, what are the stories that you would like to see that are being gathered at this time so that we can 
tell the story of this moment at a later date? Um, Whose stories or what stories? Um, I think everyone, like you said, I think everyone's story. This is, um, this is one of the few events that affects every single person on the planet pretty much. Mm. Um, so I think everyone's story, and I, I think I would like to look at it as it being an opportunity for us to not only like keep our stories and tell our stories, but also reimagine what our futures might be as well. I think this is a time where we can do that. We've been knocked a little bit sideways, or for some people, completely sideways. Now's a chance to actually reimagine what our story is into the future. Mm. Alison, what yeah, about you? Yeah, and I think similar, kind of, and a snapshot of this time. Uh, what's interesting is with Neighbour, we were just a few weeks out from the performance, um, and unfortunately we had to pull the pin for that moment, which was really upsetting. Um, but now what's happened is when Neighbour does um, actually be performed, where we invite community members to come sit around a dinner table together and share food and stories, now it has this whole other meaning <laughs> because we haven't been able to do that. And so if anything, um, then wasn't the time to do the performance. The time is later on mm. um, when, when we can. So I think that celebratory of sharing our stories and coming back together again. Yeah. Amy, for you, whose, whose stories do we need to be capturing? I think for me, probably because of the grandma book, for me, I really feel very strongly there's a real sense of urgency to capture something for our young people, our kids. I think it's already traumatic and difficult enough for us to try and process as adults when we're fully equipped and we're fully developed with all the skills. How do small kids process what's going on around them mm. in such a weird time when their parents don't even know how to process it? Yeah. So um, I've actually just signed off the text yesterday for my third book, which is called The Smiling Mask, which is a book about kids in the street, do, living their daily life, not going to school, having to wear masks everywhere, being surrounded by people with masks, and how, how that in, impacts them. And I deliberately wrote that right now because I want to capture something of what that experience is like for them. Mm. Um, but for me, also, it's the other end of the scale. So I really feel very strongly there's a, a vast absence of voice being given to our elderly, who are our most, most vulnerable, who are locked in aged care facilities. They have no access to anybody or anything. They're generally technologically challenged, so they don't even have the ability to sort of send a tweet or even a text and sometimes even make a call. And I think... That's something that I'm really noticing was this huge absence and silence of the experience of people in aged care who are very, very vulnerable, and mm. yet we're not hearing anything about what their experiences are. So I would really like to have, see that sort of develop. Um, uh, Alison, you've told us a little bit about how your practice has adapted um, or how you adapted the neighbour project into the neighbourhood. Um, how has this time affected your, your practice and your process as artists? How have the, how have the restrictions um, forced you to, to reconsider the ways in which you make work? Um, well, for me, the grandma book was booked into quite a number of schools. I was going to do author visits this year. This was the year I was going to go on the road with the book. Obviously, that doesn't happen now because we can't go into school properties anymore. So I had a long think about what to do with the book. Um, you know, the book was just saying to take off or the sales ground to a halt. So I've done a complete backflip with that. And so I created a GoFundMe page and essentially used the money from the GoFundMe to make a special story time video with um, 15 kids in Albury who all read a page from the book to camera and we made it into a little story time video and I now have that living on GoFundMe and when people donate, I send a hard copy of the book plus that story time out to aged care facilities so that our elderly can have some sort of contact with young people because they're not seeing their grandkids, mm. they're not getting visitors, mm. they're not seeing anyone from the outside world. The other thing I found for me was that I had to change a lot of the way that I work around storytelling. So I had to teach myself how to do the technical soundscaping part of podcasting. Mm. I knew how to do the storytelling part. I never knew how to do the technical part. And I had to teach myself that in order to keep the storytelling going because there was no funding coming in. There was no work coming in. There was no way to pay the bills through storytelling unless I taught myself how to upskill. So mm. for me, it has been definitely about changing the way I think about work and 
pivoting and adapting and learning new skills so that we can keep the storytelling alive. What about for you, Helen? Um, yeah, I think for me because uh, uh, my storytelling relies on those those long moments sitting with someone, and I can't travel to do that with um, as this story has evolved. So I'm kind of outsourcing some of the filming to other people. Like I've contracted someone to film a character in the UK that I was actually meant to be going um, in April to film. So it's, it's working in different ways, finding workarounds. That word pivot I use quite a bit. Sometimes I hate that word. Mm. <laughs> but, yeah, thinking more creatively, and that does excite me as well because you, that's when the unexpected can come up as well, I guess. But certainly changing my practice um, in terms of trusting other people to bring the, the, those pieces of the story back to me. I've got someone filming in Melbourne for me, particularly during the lockdown and the masks. That's an image I really wanted to capture and I couldn't get there to do it. So mm. I've had to ask other, to, other people to be my ears and eyes for me for parts of the film. What are you looking forward to as we come out of this period? Oh, wow. Um... I feel so lucky being here on the border that I don't feel like I've been hugely impacted in a lot of ways. Mm. I think seeing, seeing my children. Yeah. What are you looking forward to, Alison? Oh, live performance <laughs> <laughs> for an audience. Um, particularly, um, the majority of my work now is in immersive theatre, so immersing audiences into performances. So essentially, um, the work isn't complete until the audience are there mm. and part of it. And so I'm really, really excited, how excited to be able to do that again. Great. Amy, what are you looking forward to? Definitely live theatre. I miss <laughs> live theatre and live performance in general, music and all of those sorts of things. Um, and I guess for me, I've got a niece who turns one in about a week or so, and I haven't been able to see her for months and months. I just, yeah. I need to smooch her little face. <laughs> yeah. I probably should say my family as everyone else has, and I just didn't mention that. Go into Wales and see my yeah, family. Me too. <laughs> Can't wait to see my family as well yeah. soon. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our time here today. It's been absolutely thrilling. Thank you so much, Amy Chan, Alison Evans, Helen Newman, for joining us today. And if you want to find out a little bit more about uh, the story time for aged care, you can check out the GoFundMe page at amychan.com. Um, you can look at the Neighbourhood Project on Facebook and uh, check out Helen Newman's Solstice documentary on her website. Um, I want to thank you for being with us this afternoon and uh, for sending in your questions. It's been a, an absolute treat to be here at the Albury Library Museum for this year's Ride Around the Murray Festival online. Uh, we've got a full slate of programming still coming up, so go to the ridearoundthemurray.org.au website and uh, check out the programming that's coming up next. It's all free, um, so there's plenty for you to get involved in. And you can fill out an online survey and go into a uh, draw to win uh, six titles from the festival in a, in a pretty dashing wham uh, tote bag. Um, it, it's been my absolute privilege and pleasure to be here this afternoon. My name is Carla Conway. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of uh, the festival this year.